Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast for History 232, History of the Middle East from 1453 to the present. I believe that uh, you all can hear me and you can see my screen. So today we'll move forward as we have the past weeks. Uh, two goals, the first is updates and questions, and then number two, uh, the content I'm going to get in today will focus on this period of Ottoman history uh, from the time of uh, Abdul Hamid II. It's often referred to as Cratic Reform, uh, what happens to the Ottomans uh, during this time period as they've moved into a series of reforms referred to as the Tanzimat and the uh, Young Turks uh, coming forward, uh, which is it's quite interesting because everybody thinks that they're focused on um, what we would call democracy. Um, but it needs to be defined a little more. Uh, their focus was uh, uh, expansion, uh, going back to uh, the areas that they've lost. And so we saw the early part of this history where from Bursa, from that small area there uh, in that northwest part of Turkey, uh, they expanded out to create what we know of as the Ottoman Empire. Then after the Treaty of Karlovitz, we see then this long retreat for trying to maintain the abode of peace, being surrounded by the abode of war. And so that's the content that I'll get into today. All right, the updates then. We all know the modules open on Monday. They close on Saturday uh, for your discussion activities, your web activities. Uh, the work on the document case study usually comes in on Friday uh, if you need more time. We always have until Saturday at 11.59. So this week is uh, week seven, module seven. Uh, there's readings in there for you, a uh, podcast and a video clip. And the focus is Abdul Hamid and uh, the, the reforms of how this empire still works and it still works from the top down. Uh, I've also put in there a photo collection from the Library of Congress that's just outstanding. And the reading I have for you in there is one from 1876 uh, to the time period of about 1909. It's the Middle East uh, Journal, uh, superb uh, opportunity there. Uh, then we have the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, and then the last true Ottoman Sultan, uh, which is the video, which is just, uh, that's an outstanding, if you haven't watched that, you should. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Uh, it gives you real insights into the process of what we call state building and the idea that educated people make decisions. Uh, you get into that early part of back to democracy a little bit. It's not the vote for everyone. It's the vote for educated individuals. And once uh, modern day Turkey comes into existence uh, after the end of the empire, the Hamid period, um, you can see some of those changes that take place. All right, so discussion, uh, question four. <clears throat> Focuses on Abdul Muhammad, how he tried to save the empire. What did he think of the reforms? How did he work with the forums? What are his contributions? And what happened to him? He's really the last Ottoman uh, sultan that has power. And he wields the power. But you're dealing with a very diverse empire, a lot of issues, a lot of different groups out there as well. All right, document case study. Uh, the first three questions should have been completed. If you haven't gotten those in, you know, please do. We need to do this uh, over a period of time. Just putting something in you know, the last week of class. I mean, I'll take a look at it, but it's really not going to meet what we're looking for because you've you've got to work with the the summary first, and then you have to move into who the key people are, what are we dealing with in a territory, a civilization, an empire, a country, and then you need to apply uh, the constructs. So I've added the constructs. Uh, you can find them uh, there uh, in our material under a research material. So I added uh, a listing of them there, uh, just in case you may not have them. And I also uh, put in the civilization cycle for you. So what's coming up is question number four. That is on March 12th. Apply the civilization cycle to your document. So you take a look at the steps of the civilization cycle. And then what you do is you talk about the cycle 
in a paragraph or two, you know, list all the parts to the cycle, and then take your document, your time period, and place it in the cycle. Where are we? Are we at an expansion? Are we mixture? Are we at expansion? Are we into wars? Uh, are we into more and more conflict? Are we in a, a period of a beginning decline? Uh, are we into a period of decay? Are we into a period of collapse? And then out of the collapse, if everything, then you know, cities are abandoned, civilizations in turmoil, what comes out of the uh, collapse? Well, the last collapse of 1922 produced a myriad of states or countries, nations, whatever uh, structure you want to use, because what it is, it's, it's structural rebuilding. And that's why uh, listening to the uh, the video and watching that gives you an idea of the structures uh, that the Ottoman Empire were built upon, and you know what they faced at that time. And what we've been talking about is more modernization, and so they've got to have a bigger army in order to face off against the Europeans. I've gone over that as well. Uh, the video and the material in the module this week really supports that. The problem is, is when you break up into smaller state areas, they can't produce the army that they need to confront larger powers. And the only way they possibly could do that is, uh, you know, more of a confederated system is what they had before, because Abdul Hamid II is going to get into the difficulty because he doesn't have enough of those resources uh, to, to defend off the acts, especially coming from the Russians. So what he has to do is arm people out there. So he's just like, you know, you've got... Uh, you know, you're in your house and there's water coming through at different places. And so you got to rush over there and try to stop it. And he just doesn't have enough resources to do that. And he even arms the others. And uh, it's, it's really interesting when you get into that, you know, the Kurds, the Armenians, and you get the perspective as to, you know, really what's happening uh, from the material that I've had uh, in here. And so apply that civilization cycle that's coming up on March 12th. The idea is get everything in as close to those dates as possible so you have an opportunity to, as I go through these collaborate sessions and we read the textbook and you go through the modules, you kind of reflect a little bit about the document that you selected and begin to answer the questions and refine it and get it ready to go. You turn, turn it in um, week 14. Uh, Email it to me, and what I'll do is look at it. I'll give you some comments, and then you make final revisions week 15, and then you turn it in on uh, May 21st, which is a Friday, which is when uh, Blackboard, uh, they shut Blackboard uh, down. So we want to have everything done by that time. So the civilization uh, cycle, you can find it. It's in the, uh, the main menu under research work. The list of constructs uh, are there under research work. So, you know, explore those. Uh, take a look at those. Uh, they're all set up for you to use. If you have any questions, you can email me. We can meet in the collaborate room and go over that. You know, keep reading. You've got one of the uh, textbooks already embedded. It's important to do the readings uh, because they, in a sense, will elaborate and carry uh, a lot of the course material because I'm only here optionally for uh, uh, an hour to 45 minutes once a week, and it's not the normal time that we have and contact we would have in a campus setting. So it has to be done remotely. So you have to engage the course and you have to read the material because this is really stellar material as looking at this civilization, looking at this empire that was created and looking at what happened to it. All right. Exam two is going to come up on week 10. So on week nine, I will put those study questions out. And as you look at the syllabus, most of the uh, key topics that I have and what you've been working on for each one of those modules will be turned into essay uh, questions for you. Same format for the exam, three essay questions uh, based out of the textbook, based on the weekly modules, and based on the collaborate sessions that we have here. All right, so I think that's uh, my rundown on updates uh, for us at this point. Everything should be uh, updated within the, uh, the course calendar. Everything in the modules, I think, is working. I'll have to run uh, next week's later over this weekend to make sure that that's working. Uh, it should be. All right, so I'll turn it over to you, questions, comments, and then I'll give you the takeaway for today, and then I'll start. Any questions at this point?
Okay, good. Yeah, if anything comes up, just uh, break in, uh, use the chat feature, um, raise your hand, use your microphone. Professor Harkins, I've got a question. I just thought of it, and I'll say, fine, okay, and I'll try to help you with it if I can. All right, the uh, takeaway for today is when you leave, good, thank you. Uh, uh, the takeaway for today is explain, you be, when you leave, you should be able to explain the problems the Ottomans faced between 1876 and uh, 1909. So, and that'll be an essay question. So the questions I give you here, uh, you can use as exam questions. I may not get them on that exam because the the students, st other students may not uh, have that background because they didn't attend these, but uh, through Devin's good uh, work, we're gonna uh, have these up on another uh, source and we'll have to, we'll make that available to listen to the um, the live broadcast, but currently Blackboard, if I would start taping it now, we get through about 10 or 12 slides and the whole thing shuts down and I can't afford to shut, to shut it down. I've got to be able to talk about the history and get through it because you're here. Uh, I don't know if it's overload on that, but somehow they'll have to figure all that out. Uh, I, I need to move forward uh, with our content. and by not putting it into the collaborate recorder, which maybe gets overloaded and then it shuts down and then I lose 10 minutes trying to get back. And it's just, uh, um, till I figure it out, I'll, we'll just use what uh, Devin has set up. So we'll have the tapes. So when you leave today, then you'll say, okay, I know the problems the Ottomans faced from 1876 to about 1909 and, and how Abdul Hamid II dealt with those problems. And what you're going to see is, is they're going to be European oriented. They're going to come from other areas and these young Turks are going to have to deal with them um, because what they want is expansion. They don't like the loss of territory. They want to get what was lost after the Treaty of Karlovitz, which is about 1700 up to the time of Abdul Hamid II and beyond. So for almost a 200 year period from 1700 to 1900, they want to regain this territory. Well, the only way you're going to regain it is through um, larger armies so that you can confront the Europeans. It's one of the reasons why they moved against the Janissaries because they were just not large enough. You know, they would be good as, uh, you know, special forces uh, troops, but they couldn't confront the Europeans because there weren't enough of them and weren't using the modern techniques and tools and weaponry that they had to go to if they were going to survive. And so you see the change and, you know, people debate that change today, whether they should have done that or not. And once you, you make it, it's either a great calculation or it's a miscalculation and you can't go back. And so those are the decisions that civilizations, empires have made. All right. So that's uh, where we are. So let me move through this here uh, for us this morning. So what happens uh, as a result of uh, these areas, we'll get the uh, the little pointer out uh, for us. These areas up here, Greece, and then the Balkans, and then over into Egypt. As these areas are sort of nibbled away at and lost, there's a group of Ottomans growing coming up through their schools and in the palace school and through the empire that think we should regain them. It's the idea that if you know Britain had the idea is that well we got to regain that those those colonies in America because uh, we've lost those and we've lost other territory we just got to get it back because our people are there so that's how they start uh, text material and others will have a different kind of, of viewpoint on it and that's fine but they they want the empire that they learned and studied about. You know, they want the Balk all the Balkans, you know, they want the Greece back, uh, they want all control of Egypt, uh, these areas up in the north bordering on Russia, areas that have been lost. And so they see the reform movement as a way to do that. And that reform movement then is often referred to as Tanzimat, which I covered um, last week briefly, but uh, we did get into it. And so what happens is um, in 1860, we see many um, individuals that are in Europe um, that are followers of Islam, that are uh, tied to the empire, 
and you know they've even spread further so you know they're in what we call austria the austro-hungarian empire there's some of them are in russia they just literally um moved out a little bit and so they're seeing what what europe is really like and the clothing and the literature and the music and all of those things so that adds to the reform and also they see the kind of armies that they have okay so this is where the europeans gave them the name young turks uh, they didn't call themselves young turks uh they were there at about just before our civil war started and uh you know what they're generally r referred to as these uh, young uh, young ottomans uh, but the europeans just quite translate that out and give them the name uh, young turks you know it's sort of so it's groups that have moved and and studied and 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 got to see what the rest of the world was like all right okay and one of the leader uh, leaders is an individual by the name of namak namik mal okay and uh many have these ideas and of course um the sultans over time didn't care for these ideas what do we mean well they weren't interested in really reclaiming some territories they they wanted to hold on to generally what they had because they're moving from a decentralized back to a centralized system and then boy when you get to uh, the Hamid period, the Hamid dynasty, Abdul Hamid II is a top down. I mean, he's, he's, he's autocratic because he thinks this is the best way to save the empire at this time. And so um, that part of decentralization just wasn't able to do that. It's very, very difficult to get different areas together with different soldiers and make all this work. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take this Tanzimat reform and we're going to move it beyond where the Europeans are. So then they'll uh, leave us alone. At least that's the overall view. All right. So one of the other key leaders is Midhat Pasha. Midhat Pasha. And so there's a number of these individuals that come forward, uh, get the tag Young Turks. Uh, as, instead of being incarcerated, some of them are exiled out to European areas, which they even get more education, more background, more ideas of how they believe uh, things could work. And then these are the ones that are pushing uh, for um, a parliament and that'll come and for voting and real democracy and all that. However, uh, when the empire was started and it moved forward, it was only the educated people. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting to read about that because they said it's Educated people are, they, they don't know the issues. And uh, when they're voting, they're, they're going to, they could vote the wrong way. We can't do that. If they're educated and understand what's happening in these areas, of course, we want them to vote. But if they don't, what will happen is uh, different groups will use them and steer them to vote their way, which will hurt the Sultanate, the Caliphate, all of these kinds of things. Well, the West, of course, condemned a lot of that, especially the Austro-Hungarians and the Russians and all that. And those are the ones that should speak about it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the but you see, the Ottomans sometimes didn't know exactly the internal workings. They had some idea, but the average person didn't. I mean, if I ask you today to tell me what's going on in, in the Pub People's Republic of China, you say, well, you know, who's in charge of all this? So it's other than the leader. It's like, no, we're not sure who's calling the shots over there, what's going on. But we know we have all these things happening. Why are they happening? Um, you don't know. It's a mystery. And so this is what the uh, Ottomans are going to have to face. So uh, what happens is uh, Midhat and um, uh, Kamik and others are going to lead what we call Westerniz led Westernization and reform. So all these reforms are going to go in and they try to deal with them from this period right after the Greek nationalism right up until about uh, 1884. Abdul Hamid is going to be there about 1876. So what's going to happen? All right. Well, we're going to divide the empire into 28 provinces. All right. So we've, we've got some changes here, which means we're going to cross different uh, cultural lines, ethnic, all kinds of things. But, you know, individuals are going to get in, into these, these provinces. So they'll try to line them up, but nothing ever is perfect when you're dividing things up like that. Usually in a decentralized system, uh, the borders, what I refer to as soft borders, 
they're not going to fight you over them. But today, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me there isn't a border fight or an air air and planes flying in the East China Sea if they get too close to this line or these ships to get too close to this line. That's what it is. It's all tense. It was never this way in this empire. They had soft borders. People for hundreds of years, for 500 years, lived in these areas, and they went across these borders. They shared the water. They shared the grain. They made it work. Uh, people that were in the core areas, you know, they had sort of an idea, but it's like, you know, those people tend to get along. And what we end up with now, um, since 1922, is what we call border wars. Um, this is ours. This is everybody wants to take something that somebody else has. You know, the idea of sharing went out the window like that, you know. You know, if you've got something, you got to figure out how to work with it. Because if you don't, you'll end up destroying each other as well as the resource you're after. What are they fighting for? After a while, they don't know. So they're going to divide it up into 20 provinces. That's already we're moving in a different direction. That sends up a lot of signals to them. It's like, well, who's going to create these? Why are we doing that? And then the world said, well, you know, change, change, change. Why are we changing? They don't like that. That's what they ask. Listen to the tape that I have on there. It's just classic to listen to him. He's so powerful. And it asks the question, why do we want to do this? Well, change is good, you know, new blood and all that. Yeah, tell me about it. Uh, they didn't want that. Something has been working that long. Why do we have to? Well, we got to change it. We got to have, you know, uh, you know, refresh it. We do all those things. And they don't like it. No, that's not what they want. No. And so the power to appoint governors is in the hands of the sultan. So now we're going to have, and the Sultans always had that. And usually they made excellent choices and individuals could get along with the different groups that are there. You know, they're, they're so, so much a greater variety of languages, cultures, ethnicity through this is that the governors just basically knew how to work with each group. And the idea, if we're going to be successful, these groups have to get along. And it's never perfect, but they were working on that. Okay. And so we're going to suppress nationalism, all right, because you know, nationalism um, causes other things to happen, and the Ottomans are not interested uh, during this time period after uh, Greek nationalism right through 1876, right up to 1909. They want to, sup they want to suppress that. Yeah, go ahead. Got a um, question, okay. Devin? Yeah, so last week um... – when we were talking about Tanzimat, you talked about how uh, the Ottomans took on patriotism, like the West. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. so now they're getting rid of it, or no? They're still very patriotic, but they don't want to be. They, they don't want a nationalistic state. Okay. Because a, a nationalistic state's going to expand and take back those territories is what it's going to be. It's going to the abor the boat of peace is going to turn into a uh, the boat of war against the. Their their neighbors who are, who are at war, you know, they they wanted to suppress that it, the loyalty is to the sultan, and to the empire, and to the and to Ottomanism, that's the the structure. So they want them to feel good about that that they're Ottomans. But the uh, the idea of becoming very nationalistic, you know what happens when you become very nationalistic, uh, you move in a certain direction that leads to, well, let's just move in another direction, go back to war, take over this territory, occupy it, and we're going to, it goes back to that civilization cycle where we're going to, we're going to war. And, and that's what they believe that nationalism would uh, lead to. And in most cases in history, it does. Because what you're doing is that you're, the, the lines are disappearing. And so it's like those 300 states in Germany, are they're gone. They're never going to come back. No. And uh, all those uh, feudal systems in Japan, they're gone. They're not coming back. And all those little republics in Italy are all gone like that. So they wanted them to have that, but they wanted to have the same focus on the, the structures with their, with their governors, but yet be uh, focused on a very patriotic toward what we call Ottomanism. And that's much different than the other um, ideas uh, that, are, that are floating around. So you're, you're loyal to this um, dynasty, this group of people, to the sultan and to the role of the sultan. The sultan's slowly starting to take power back. You know, they're shifting to um, a centralized system. And we don't have very many decentralized systems left today, if any. And so in order to, in order to survive, 
you you need to do that because there's a decentralized system. One area after another is going to be picked off. Look what happened in Greece. Look what happened in the Balkans, Egypt, and all of that. And so, don't don't want to don't want to go down that way. That's kind of the thought. Uh, it, some of this, as I go through, it'll, it'll come a little clearer to you. So what they want to focus on uh, is self-government and, and independence. Now that's this is the transition. So we're not going to be fully centralized, maybe f fully decentralized. So right in the middle then is this part is let's see if they can have a little self-government and keep their independence, but I'm going to pull everything back and create this national army and it's going to move collectively and it's going to have these Western um, uh, military weapons and we're going to have all of these things and we're really going to start to guard our borders and take care of our people. And at the same time, we're going to kind of keep some of this local governing activity and uh, an air of, of independence with the governors are there. But at any time, we could pull that back and control. And so what they're but they, they want the best of both worlds, and it could work that way. Um, we had a lot of that during what we call states' rights, but our system is look at how we're each of the states handling all of this vaccine now. You know, and uh, in a national, in a, in a in a centralized system, the centralized system would take care of it, and the and the states would do that. So we have a little bit on both sides as well, where the federal government does some, and the states do some things. This is what they're talking about right here. They're moving the dial into the center, uh, so it's not too far one way or another. That's dangerous, and it was for Abdulhamid the second to try that. Okay, the reason what happened is they didn't like it. They had three sultans in one year. And then Abdul Hamid II comes in in 1876, like that. So what does it mean? Is that uh, a change, uh, just to change, is that they're changing more or less just for survival because they can't keep the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians and others out. They can't, you know, they need a much larger army, a much larger navy. They need a lot more income. They need a lot more revenue. Centralized systems tax, right? And they're going to have to follow the same suit in order to do that. Instead of relying on, you know, like we have, you know, this national guard and each state has the their guard like that. Well, then we have a big federal army that's there. Uh, and what happens is in order for them to function, they're going to have to then follow the same pattern of moving a more centralized system with uh, more and more taxes, which then impacts these provincial areas that are now all divided up, you know, so they're creating a structure. So they're moving from a from an Ottoman structure uh, to a new structure in order to see if they can survive the pressure that's coming. Um, once we got Karlovitz and they're not expanding anymore, okay, he supported and proclaimed a written constitution. All right, so you see that the central system, uh, but in times of emergency, he's going to put it on the side. He's he's going to he's going to take his power and and use it. And so he said, okay, understands that we got to make some changes in order to get this system. So what it is, it's moving to what we would call like a parliament or a house of representatives and things like that. Uh, these young Turks and others want all these things written down. Well, anytime you write them down and you're going to do all this, it takes a lot of money to do that. A lot of people in the empire you know, are wondering what's going on here. The only thing they've ever known is the sultan. And then they have the governors. You know, what the sultan says and the, ca the caliph. Uh, and the whole empire is referred to as a caliphate. That's what they understand. And so they like this uh, decentralized system, but it's starting to shift a little bit. Okay, and so uh, with it, two years after he's in the Russian War uh, in 1878, um, uh, Abdulhamid II suspended Parliament because he's got to deal with the Russian War. I can't have all these people sitting around talking about it, playing politics about it. I mean, his job is—it's uh, a job of leaders throughout the world. It's security. I mean, he understands what's at stake. Those are born into the dynasty, his family line, all of this. This is how it works. This is the way it's going to be. And he's got the power to make it work. And so, you know, if 
well, we got a war. He doesn't need to listen to a parliament telling him what he needs to do or not to do. He has the power to do it. And so he suspends it. Well, of course, they don't like that, you see. And what's going to happen is all these folks like Midhat and the rest are going to get into a lot of trouble as we get closer to the war in Libya late in, in, in the early 1900s. And then we get into the first Balkan War and the second Balkan War, and then it rolls into World War uh, I. And then it's the old imperial system, the that of uh, the Ottomans that's going to actually get them through. They, it's the only empire that really survived World War I. The other three are gone. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is gone. The, the Russian Empire is gone. And the German Empire is gone. The Ottomans survived until 1922. Um, and there's a, I'll get into that. It's a great story of that, OK? Um, he exiled Midhat. And, and, and ignored the constitution because now they have these, so the sultan can exile them because we don't have time to deal with this. We got the Russians on our doorstep, and he knows what the Russians want. They want one thing, and they, they they skip over it. They don't even say Istanbul. They want Constantinople. They want the Straits. They want all that, and he knows that. The sultan knows that, and so he, he doesn't have any time to worry about some of these other issues. He's going to basically defend the empire like that. Okay, the end of the war. And the sultan controlled the government. And as we move forward, a lot of these reforms are going to start to drop by the boards because it was an emergency situation. And what was coming back to the to the dynasty, to the family, to the structure was there is that this group constantly talking about this and parliament and everything. By that time, the Russians will take in a third of the empire. So action has to take. So he suspends that, exiles them, takes charge. And the end of the war, he controlled the government, and that's the end of the reforms. But they're still, you're going to see them. I'll go back and pick some of them up. And by that time, remember I gave you 1876 uh, to 1884? So he comes in in 1876. It doesn't take him about eight years. He's got, he's got that centralized power back. Got it back, okay? Modernization through liberal political reforms ended. That was it. Yeah. Hadi Sharif, Hadi Humayun, all these uh, tons of modernization, liberal political reforms ended because it was really shaking up the whole empire. Um, he might have been too late and he came in 1876. He couldn't have gotten there any earlier because of the turmoil that was there. Um, but in a sense, he gives it the life that it'll go until 1922 um, because these reformers uh, that are exiled are going to continue to come back and stir things up. And the these political reforms began to impact the structures of the empire. Um, okay. So we're going to drift back a little bit and I'm going to run this 1800 and 1900 and then you can see what happens. So I've already given you a little introduction and that introduction is to Al Duhamid and what happened in that in that process. It's that Russian war. Those are the ones that they've been uh, sparring with, and it'll go right up until um, Sarajevo in 1914, the guns of August. Okay, between 1800 and 1900, expenses uh, are in, being increased. Things are becoming costlier in the empire. Okay. And why? Wars and military modernization. Once you move into that direction, you know, it's just like anything else. It's like cell phones. Oh, that's wrong. I got a cell phone. What's wrong with those? Well, every once in a while, you got to get a new one, don't you? And a new plan. And uh, they're bigger, costly. It, it, nothing ever is going to go down. It just takes more and more money. 15 years ago, people didn't put money into those. Now they've got to put money into those. And then all the software, all these uh, computer material, it's just, it becomes a drain. And so as the sultans decided, well, we have to modernize. Uh, we have to be like these Europeans. And then we want a military like these Europeans with weapons and resources like that. And then they get into these wars, short wars, long wars, uh, a few days, a few weeks, a few months to a few years on some of these. costs a lot of money. Uh, troops aren't going to be there for, uh, for free. Janissaries basically gone. 
uh, too small, wouldn't uh, move with modern weapons. Uh, you know, we can't use them. They, you know, they're nice more for ceremonial purposes, but they, they can't do anything. Okay. So in order to survive, right before Abdul Hamid II came in, the Ottoman Empire borrowed billions from Western Europe. Europeans, you know, had all the cannons, had all the resources, railroad engines, track, all that. So they wanted to modernize and they said, okay, well, they don't have the money. And the Europeans said, well, we can help you. Well, we can uh, loan you the money, uh, and then um, you could buy these goods and products from us. And so they did. You know, that's that's the direction they went into. So that's, you know, it's billions from Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. 1876, results. The time Abdul Hamid II came in, the income could not keep up with expenditures. Only way you're going to get more money uh, is they can't do everything is to tax the people. So you got to come up with a priority. The priority is that, you know, we want to keep the abode of peace. However, there's a group of young Turks out there and then they get the constitution and Abdul Hamid, you know, it says fine written constitution. And then um, what happens is all these reforms, uh, now getting to the point where they're going to cost money. And so where are we going to get this? Well, we can borrow some and then we keep expending more and then we can tax people more, which makes them unhappy because the, the taxes are pretty significant. And so they produce less and less or they leave or they're unable to keep up. Europeans come in and they don't have to pay those taxes. So you can see what's happening here. As a result, when you go back to that time period of 1821-22 that we covered about Greek nationalism, and there's more imports and less exports. Okay, why are there imports? Well, it's the same kind of thing we have here, is because the people that were working here, you know, 1950 to 1980, 1990, um, what they produced cost too much because they got paid, and you know, this is the wage like that, so. The Europeans and others see this as a great way to drop off these inexpensive imports. And then what happens, their own businesses, basically these great crafts and guilds, beautiful. You know, you buy one item and it lasts you 50 years. You go to the Europeans, uh, you'll have to buy, you know, one every three years. But it costs less, but in the long run, it doesn't. And so they're exporting less. More imports, less exports. Not a good balance of trade. No, not at all. Bulk imports were consumer goods. Sound familiar? Mm hmm Bringing them in. It destroyed much of the traditional infrastructure uh, that they had. One way to try to get over it is to go back to uh, centralization. The other way to do it is to put heavy tariffs on those products coming in. Europeans didn't like that. What could they do? Not loan money. You keep doing that to our products. We're going to boost the interest rate on you. We can't do that. Try us. So they got them over a barrel. So all these consumer goods come in. They start to impact them. Consumer goods don't come in. There's problems on the street because uh, we're short of these things. Why do we do this? You know, five years ago, we used to make all those things here. We, you know, even, even to the food and the vegetables, that's still being produced, but you see bulk imports are consumer goods. People depend on that. Lifeline is the dynasty. The empire's got to keep those products rolling in. It's called supply chain. And when you don't get it, you know what happens, right? So they know that from Egypt, cotton, grain, Egypt, it's like a gold mine for them. So we'll get more loans. We'll use what's coming out of Egypt. Egypt pays tribute. They don't mind. They, they've got egg. They, they can afford to do that. But it's only one source of a revenue stream coming in that the Ottoman emperors, the Ottoman sultans will use. Like, wow. Okay, so everybody, you go in, everybody wants to have a collateral security. And now, right, the tribute from Egypt is used to secure more loans. Okay. 
then they have customs duties, right? They still control the straits. Everything that comes out of this Black Sea area comes down through the straits like that. They charge duties. That's where they make their money, you know, income. And it's been pretty, it's excellent. That's what they, they wanted in 1453, and that's what they have now. And that's what the Russians are interested in. That's why the Russians still control the Crimea. They shouldn't have that. That really, what a struggle. You know, they just, the Russians, timing is right. They just walk in and take things and nobody does anything for them. It's very tragic to many of the Ottomans who lived in those areas. Um, so customs duties from Istanbul. Yeah, okay. Security. And so the Europeans are getting more and more uh, their hand in controlling uh, land and resources, okay? So what happens? Abu Hamid comes in. And when he does, the Grand Viziers, uh, new ones are appointed who aren't as uh, focused on this westernization because they understand the mood of the people. And the mood is, uh, you know, we don't like all this. So one way to cut some of these taxes and to get the local industry back up and the piece work and all those the beautiful gills they had in producing everything that the world loved and leather work and wood and metals they had it all so the grand viziers working with the new sultan said hey, we got to curb these loans but we won't know we won't be able to do this you, the grand viziers would never say that whatever the sultan said and i know there's a lot of movies and things that are out there you would never question the sultan the Sultan would tell the Grand Viziers that we're going to stop the loans, and the Grand Viziers would do exactly as the Sultan had. Don't go back and have a committee meeting and then come back and say, well, I'll get him to do this or that. No, no. It's, 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 that's why they call it autocratic. I and mean, they think, oh, that's just a terrible uh, thing. He's an autocrat. Well, his main job is to take care of the empire, and he's got to make the decision. That's what he's there for. That's what his family has been doing. And he says he knows these loans are bad. They want us to take them. It'll be hard. We'll get out of it, but we're going to stop taking these loans. Got to curb them, not totally turn them off, but slow them down. Okay. And so, what the British bankers did is had the Grand Viziers removed. They put enough pressure on the Sultan um, that if he didn't do that, because they didn't like being talked to the way that the Grand Vizier talked to them. You know, if you ever have a chance to take an advanced class, take one and you can you can really I've got quite a bit on the Grand Viziers and we won't be able to get into each one of them. But I've, I've read about them. And uh, these are folks that uh, as loyal as can be, they did what they were supposed to do. And the British said, don't come and tell us that you're going to curb these loans and and that uh, you want lower interest rates and things like that. And he says, that's what we want. When they, and then the British representatives there in Istanbul would find out, well, who, where did this come from? And he said it, it came from our sultan, from the sultan. And what the sultan says is what we do. And so the bankers leaned on the sultan, maybe offered more. There's interesting stories about that. And so uh, and the British basically threatened him, just threatened the sultan. And you don't want to do that. But they did. And it was terrible. And so the sultan uh, removes the grand vizier's. And the British are happy. They don't like being talked to that way. Okay, So the Europeans were now believing they had the right to intervene in Ottoman affairs. Right. As their loans grew, they had a right to interfere politically and do things. Now, you might look at how some of the world works today and when individual countries and things get loans and what's happening in different parts of the world. And along with the money goes this hand in there that's going to uh, tell you what button to push and when to push it. And so the Europeans have that, and so the Ottomans know it. They've got to deal with it. It's another aspect of what you're seeing in this autocratic reform, right? So before Abdul Hamid uh, comes in, the uh, session of 1876, the foreign debt uh, was about 200 million English pounds. Can you believe that? About 200 million. English pounds, 1976, okay. Yearly interest was about 12 million. So I'm saying, well, that's a lot. Boy, if I, if I went through what they used the money for and how it came in and all of these kinds of things. So what they're trying to do now is really um, catch up <clears throat> equal and even surpass the um, 
the Europeans until the Europeans are happy to loan them the money because uh, if they can't pay it, they can get other things. That's what they're interested in. Well, you can't pay it, but uh, we can have this port. We'll have a base here. We'll bring in our people and operate uh, over this land area here. And the Ottomans would say, well, we don't have to pay you. You can this and this and this and this. It's the same thing that happened in China is how China was carved up by foreign powers as well. Same model. You can see that. They were, uh, the imperial system in China was a very decentralized system as well. Uh, it's no longer decentralized uh, after 1949. Ottoman revenue and income was 22 million pounds. That's their income. So if their income is that, uh, ah, 12 million has to go to pay the interest. Wow. The highest personal debt in the world at that time was here. And many of the people within the empire had no idea. Occasionally you hear it on the news in our country. They say today that every individual alive, uh, you know, this is how much money you would have to pay to reduce, to eliminate the debt we have. And it's kind of scary because it's a big number. And it's like, well, how did we get to that number? Well, we just needed a little money along the way. So we've uh, borrowed some and borrowed quite a bit. And so here... By the time of Abdul Hamid, you can see what the modernization and the reforms that started after the Greek independence has produced for us. Okay. Well, you can handle certain things, but then certain things that you don't expect. You know, like here, we've had a pandemic. We've had a lot of um, activities in the, in the streets. There's just a lot of things been going on, and it's like, wow, we didn't expect this. We didn't expect that. It's like... Where did these come from? You know, so a year ago in the early part of March, you know, there were some things we were hearing, and then all of a sudden, wow, middle of March, everything changed. Well, now they get hit with a famine. Um, no idea that it's going to be there. Lots of problems with locusts, lots of problems with drought, not moving water, uh, more focused on railroads and other kinds of building structures. They get a big famine that hits. Therefore, they could no longer pay the interest on the loan. They needed to use the money to buy food, to feed the people. You have to feed them. You got to get out of the, the famine. So now they couldn't even pay the interest on the loan. They had empires bankrupt by 1876. That's what happened. From, eight, about, from 18, um, you could say 21, 1822 until 1876 that thrust of that liberal political modernization produced imperial bankruptcy. What happens when they're bankrupt? People don't like it. Word spreads. How did that happen? We paid these taxes. We paid all this. What happened? So trouble breaks out. Village after village, community after community, provincial area after provincial area. So people are pitted against each other. Those that say, you shouldn't be rebelling. We'll get out of this some other way. And they say, no, no. And they just, so what you have is you have a lot of these, what I call brush fires uh, throughout the empire. And a couple of them lead to major rebellion. Now that's going to cost us a whole lot more money to take care of all of this that we didn't need to, in the first place, right? And where is it going to start? It's going to start there in the Balkans and it's going to go all the way through 1918 when World War I ends, and it's going to pick up in 1919, and it's going to go on and on right up until today. This is where it really starts. Mm -hmm. It was moving to 1848 when the Balkans really tried to create the uh, sort of the United Balkans. That was the last gasp of trying to uh, unify them uh, into a loose confederated system. Didn't work. And when they tried in 1914, um, the Archduke was assassinated. The Austro-Hungarians would have nothing to do with him because he was interested in letting Hungary go and creating a confederated system in the Balkans. So they worked on that from 1848 until um, 1914. And when he died, that dream died with him. Bulgaria and Macedonia, what revolts? Montenegro and Serbia, what revolts, right? 
prospect theory of war. Okay, you may not be familiar with that, and I'll just kind of briefly summarize it here for you. Um, countries uh, generally go to war to maintain the status quo. In other words, they have a territory, they have a periphery, they have a defined civilization, a defined empire, and that's it. If they lose part of it, the theory says that that country then will go to war to maintain the status quo. And if you look at most of our wars, when somebody takes something or bombs certain areas and uh, land troops on it and take it, the, the country that is there and we had to flee, um, will then not only declare war, uh, but they will be dedicated to getting back what they lost. And so now all these rebellions are breaking up, uh, starting, and, the, and we, you see it breaking up. They're in Montenegro, they're in Serbia, they're Bulgaria, they're Macedonia. All of these start up, which means the empire is now going to lose more land, more provincial areas, more territory, more income. That's the outgrowth of what they got into when Tan Samat, uh, Hadi Sharif, Hadi Humayun got a little bit out of control when the reform started uh, move along. And at the same time, trying to create a centralized system, moving away from traditional Janissaries and the traditional aspects of how this empire functioned. Uh, it gets sort of in this middle zone <clears throat> where it tries to, you know, deal with the old order and deal with the change and we're gonna to try to work it and it didn't work. No, that's the prospect theory of war. Nations, countries, civilizations go to war to maintain the status quo. They wanna keep what they have. If they lose something, they'll go to war to get it back. If you take something, you're gonna get a counterattack. It's gonna happen. So in 1877, what they want is status quo. And if they don't get it, they're going to go to war and expend more money. And that's what they do. And that's why they engage war with the Russians and the Austrians. They keep needling them in these areas using the excuse that, well, we have, there are people there. There's Christians there. You haven't been taking care of them. Um, there's been abuses. The Russians are saying it to them. The Austro-Hungarians are saying it. And the Germans say it to an extent as well. The Ottomans are saying no, no, there might be some of that, but you're, you're not, no, that's not right. But they're just agitators. They're not really interested in the orthodoxy religion. They're interested in the land and the people to dominate and exploit them. That's all Austria wants to do. It's all Russia wants to do. I mean, you could say it's textbook case when you look at it. And that's, you know, Russia did the same thing in parts of Iran and Iraq. Uh, same kind of thing, right? So Russia declared war on the Ottomans in 1877. Why do you think they did that? Because Abu Hamid is, anytime you have a transition of power like that and somebody new comes in, boom, a country's, the, the country on the border that thinks they can overcome you is gonna do it. And so they, 1870, that's, this is the war of 1876, 1877. Once they get the parliament going and the Russians see that saying, that's great. Uh, we'll be in uh, Constantinople before they even make a decision because they, they'll just talk it to death, right? And that's generally, Abu Hamid figured that out. Go ahead, Devin. Got a question? Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is the part where he gets rid of the parliament because he needs to make decisions for the war, right? <laughs> that's right. Oh. Or they'll be in, they'll be in uh, Istanbul where he's at. He'll have to flee. <laughs> the whole, the whole dynasty. Yeah, they'll all have to flee. Because like the Russians were coming. The exactly. They didn't like this. This is not something they're interested in doing. The Russians are too close. And plus you got revolts breaking out. You know, the Russians precipitated the revolts. They seeded the revolts. The Russians are good at that. You see, you have to worry about that. It's just these aren't revolts for democracy on their own. You know, the Russians are saying, if we're here, it'll all be better. You need to do this. And these people have been, you know, they tell them everything they want to hear. And they, they believed it, a lot of them. And some didn't, but not enough to turn uh, to turn the case. They couldn't do it. No. Russia declares war on the Ottomans in 1877. And in March of 1878, the Treaty of San Stefano. What does that do? Okay. 
well, it's going to do a few things. Yep, you can see this. This is what happens. It's all part of fragmentation. It's all part of the civilization cycle. They're losing the periphery. When they lose the periphery, they lose revenue. They lose control. They lose resources. They lose people. So it's shrinkage to the core leading to collapse uh, after World War I. And so the Treaty of San Stefano, it's a short war. It's about 24 months, I mean, a little, little longer, but it's uh, um, 77, 78. What happens? Ah, the independence of Montenegro, Serbia, and Romania. All right. So look what happens from 1700 on. Not only do you Greek nationalism, but now this is what comes out of it. It's exactly what the Russians and the Austrians wanted. It's this is their march uh, toward Greece, toward everything that's up in this part here. This is what's what they're after. And then when they're done with that, they'll move out into these areas, and then they'll move down and cross North Africa until 1922 and the birth of modern Turkey. And then a variety of other states, nations are created. The British are there helping others. You can see that as well. Wow. This is what's happening. Okay. Ah, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Autonomous rule. That's like a step down from full independence, but now they're autonomous from the, the Ottomans. So what they're doing is they're losing the Balkans. This is what uh, activates the young Turks. They don't like this, uh, the young Ottomans. They want these territories back. And they will actually lead armies uh, when we get down to, you know, mid hot and There's a group of three of them, a triumvirate, and I'll, I'll come to those down the road, but we're not there yet. We're just giving you the, the background here. So Bosnia and Herzegovina have autonomous rule. Okay, wow, that's moving along. Hmm, Bulgaria is created within the empire. So you can see what happens. So he, meaning Abdul Hamid II, inherits a long period of time. And before he comes in, you know, we have three sultans in one year. We have all of this process of maybe we need to really you know, let's get back to a centralized system and stabilize everything. And then over time, we can decentralize it out again. And what happens, they manage to make it to the mid-range where they're not fully decentralized and they're not fully centralized. They think they can make that. And what happens is they're going to lose this territory. And that then gives them a lot less revenue, a lot less control over trade. And who's going to befriend all of these areas? Well, of course, the Austro-Hungarians and the Russians. Many of the Ottomans that live in this these areas have been in here for 500 years or, or more in these areas. They came, um, some of them as early as the 1200s, 1300s, right? And they've been there a long time. Um, some of them can't remember when. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's not like, well, they're a first, second generation. I mean, there's many generations. And the other people that are Christians there and, and other religious uh, groups, they all know that. They've been there a long time. But now what's going to happen is they're going to be independent. And so now we're creating things within the empire, and that's harder for them. So they're seeing what's happening. They're losing uh, about a third of the whole empire here as a result of modernization that was set up in order to stem, push off, slow down, stop, move beyond uh, the European, uh, the Eastern European powers and uh, the British as well. And now they're in, in decline and uh, they're not going to get out of it. There'll be some resurgences, but it'll lend to total collapse. And then they're going to be fully decentralized. There won't be any uh, confederation. It'll be a series of nation states, and you uh, fend for yourself. Okay. 
Anglo-Ottoman Convention. Isn't that nice? What happens to Cyprus goes to Britain. You go back in the early history how the Ottomans fought to get a hold of uh, Cyprus and Rhodes, Crete. So British are in there as well. They're coming up uh, in the Mediterranean. They want bases, right? It's a convention. We'll work it out. Yeah, you, you can kind of hang around and be in this area for a while, but uh, we're going to, we'll take it. We'll, we'll work it out. And so we'll control it. We'll get our ships out there. We'll get all that, right? Sure. Yeah, it's the Suez. It's the lifeline to India. And so, you know, Cyprus is a good place to be. And it's close to the coastal area, and that's where the British want to be. Why? Well, they want to keep an eye on the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians because they seem to be instrumental in getting a lot of these areas now free. We're almost there. Just hang on. Almost there. What we now have uh, during the time period of Abu Hamid II, as we come out of that Russian war and the Treaty of San Stefano, is a foreign policy crisis. Uh, not only a domestic crisis, but there's an economic crisis as well, a uh, social crisis, and there's a big foreign policy crisis. Pretty much at this point, the, uh, the Ottomans are unable to defend themselves against the Russians. Once, when, when the Russians declare war on you, you, they know they can win. And other than that, they wouldn't declare war. Uh, yeah, they're going to win. And so the Ottomans can't defend themselves against because they have more resources. They've got uh, weapons. Uh, you know, they've modernized and they've got this very strict autocratic system there that's in place with the imperial family, all of that. But that's getting close because in world when World War One breaks out, that won't hold for Russia. Okay, reforms were insufficient to save the empire. See, I kind of gave you all that the last two sessions. I could have just stayed, you know, saved us two sessions and said, "All right, reforms were insufficient to save the empire," <laughs> and you would have wondered what does that mean. <laughs> and now, now you can see it. That's it. They tried it. A bit beefy there, over there's more to it. Much better though, so. <laughs> yeah, it is. We could just say, okay, class, we just the reforms are insufficient to save the empire, and then oh, what's that? Don't worry about it. Write it down. Let's go. Move on. Yeah, yeah. One move on. Oh exactly. my god. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, there's a lot in that sentence right there. You can see it. What they tried to do, and how they tried to do it, and they ended up bankrupt, and the Russians knew it, and the Austro-Hungarians knew it. Okay. That's, uh, I think, what we'll do for today. It's um, already over a few minutes, but uh, thank you for coming.